Welcome, everybody. So good to see you, particularly those who are turning their cameras on. We love that, so thank you. But if you can't turn your cameras on, we understand. I wanna welcome you all to The Last Ecstatic Days, a conversation about community care with Dr. Aditi Seti and Hannah Fowler. My name is Andy Ingle, and I'm senior programmer at Reimagine. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a white cisgender male. I've got glasses, salt and pepper hair. I'm wearing a nice white, cozy, fluffy shirt because it's a little chilly in New York today. And I've got an orange background behind me. This month, we are presenting programs on Wednesdays that focus on values, wishes, and intentions. Um, and it's people like Aditi and Hannah, our speakers today, who I'll introduce momentarily. Um, who help us understand that planning is a toolkit for self-knowledge, for agency, uh, and empowerment. And I know it's scary to plan, and uh, but we believe at Reimagine it's ultimately a shield against anxiety and fear. Um, in this month's three-part series at Reimagine, we'll learn about building care teams for the dying, um, we will learn how to manage love and stuff, uh, meaning all the material objects belonging to our nearest and dearest. And we're going to learn about avoiding missed opportunities for end of life planning, particularly among underrepresented communities. And later when I stop talking, I will paste a link in the chat so you can register for all these wonderful events. Um, uh, oh, I'm going to share my slide deck. I forgot to do that. Hold on. Let's see. Great. Can you guys all see this? Fantastic. Okay. Um, uh, as some of you uh, may know at Reimagine, we've been leaning into the theory and practice of post traumatic growth. And that's the sciencey name to describe the struggle we experience with grief, loss, adversity, and then using that experience to spark discoveries about ourselves and our communities. And by the way, this concept of PTG or post-traumatic growth, it's not unique to Western science. You can find it in other global traditions. Um, and I want to point out that next month we'll be exploring the indigenous concept of Nepantla, which is the in-between space for all kinds of transformation. So please be sure to check that out. PTG, post-traumatic growth, it's rooted in psychological research. And the idea is that those who experience adversity and loss can also experience strength, optimism, um, more meaningful relationships, and a deeper appreciation of life, as well as heightened spirituality and purpose, meaning. Um, at the same time, it's my belief that it's perfectly not, it's perfectly acceptable to not experience any growth at all when you're encountering loss. Um, the majority of us are zooming in from the United States, also known as Turtle Island by Native Americans and their allies. I'm in Lenape Hoking, where a large city called New York is located on occupied land. I ask you to join me in acknowledging indigenous communities in North America, their elders, both past, present, as well as future generations. Mm -hmm. And I'm stating all of this because it's a step to continue the process uh, of dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and white supremacy. We're all interested in knowing where you guys are located. Um, so please put that in the chat. We have a very helpful map that maybe Aditi or Hannah can paste in the chat. Um, it's called native-land.ca. And you can check out that site to learn about locations of indigenous people, past, present, and future. Uh, and for those who wish, click on the CC icon that you see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, you can get a live transcript of what's being said. And another good tip is that you can save the chat by clicking on the three dots in the chat box. Um, and feel free to send me a note during this session. If you're having any technical issues, I might be able to help you. So I'm going to stop. Um, and I want everyone to know that uh, this 
again, is being recorded. Um, you'll get a follow-up email. Anyone who registered for this event will get a follow-up email with a recording, but the portion of the film that we're gonna show will not be included. Um, finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Hannah Fowler and Aditi Seti. Hannah Fowler is a hospice nurse and an end-of-life doula, a facilitator and educator who brings conscious living and dying practices to individuals and organizations around the world. She is the Director of Education and Engagement for the Center of Conscious Living and Dying in, Na in Asheville, North Carolina. And she's on the faculty with the Conscious Dying Institute. Um, and thank you for plugging this Conscious Dying Institute. Um, she also serves on the advisory board of the Completed Life Initiative. Um, Hannah has presented for the Center for Death and Society, Redesigning Death Care, and the National End of Life Doula Alliance. She's been featured on podcasts, including The Best Life, Best Death. Through trainings, workshops, and grief rituals, Hannah teaches how awareness of death goes beyond honoring our last act of living and allows us to open to the mystery of life itself. Prior to death work, Hannah was the director of the Intensive Outpatient Psychotherapy Unit at the Lower Keys Medical Center and an ICU step-down nurse at the University of Vermont Medical Center. Hannah is certified in energetic trauma release and healing touch. Aditi Seti is a hospice and palliative care physician. She's an end-of-life doula. She's a fantastic musician. And she's the executive director of the Center for Conscious Living and Dying. Aditi is an emerging and important voice for shifting our culture's understanding and approach to dying, death, and bereavement care. Um, we last heard from Aditi at a table talk program right here at Reimagine with Dr. Nahid Dosani on South Asian perspectives concerning palliative care. It was fantastic. You can check out a recording of that in our Vimeo library. I'll also make sure to put that in the chat. Um, Anna Aditi has been a featured guest at Reimagine Vigils, where she gets to wear her musician hat. Um, with that, I'm going to hand this over to Hannah and Aditi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry, I was waiting for you, Hannah. Are you going to share the? Take it. <laughs> there you go. Just have some internet. <laughs> Andy, we were going to ask if you would just start by sharing the clip. Sure thing. You're up for it. I, I am up for it. Thank you. More screen sharing, which I will do. <laughs> okay. While while Andy pulls that up, I just wanted to say it's great to be here with you all and to see so many familiar faces. I'm so grateful for those of you who came today. I guess I wanna start maybe by throwing out a question to the two of you, you know, what struck me, and I think we all have that question maybe in our heads for those of us watching this sneak peek for the first time is why did the hospice deny this request from Ethan that he wanted to be filmed until the very end? So, this was March 2021, and COVID was, you know, in full force. Um, and initially, that didn't stop the hospice I work for, the administration, from trying to get this approved. We had a very short window from when I, when I met Ethan via a Zoom call on March 17th. It was a Wednesday. He was told he was dying. He was having trouble swallowing, so anything that would go in his throat, would he would aspirate. So he was at that point where he was about to stop eating and drinking completely naturally because of the disease progression. And so we quickly got him from Charlotte to Asheville, from inpatient hospice to inpatient hospice. And initially they didn't wanna transport him. They said, he's too fragile, he may die en route. So that was Thursday and we got him to Asheville Friday. Um, so on that Friday, I must have had five or six calls with first marketing and outreach and compliance and HR, all these, you know, um, people that are responsible for ensuring um, or protecting the organization first. 
and from liability, from risk, from bad PR, from bad whatever. And so I honored that. We, we were so close. There were consents being sent from Jessica Zitter's organization to the film and everything was looking good. And then at six o'clock, five o'clock, he was rolling in at six, at five o'clock, the highest up said, this is a no-go. The highest up, the VP of division of Southeast, whatever. So, and the biggest fear was that something in the filming process would be released that would look make hospice look bad. So I'm not even sure I'm supposed to tell you all that, but that was the truth. Um, and so I remember when that happened, my heart just sunk. It was like, and I've been in this inpatient hospice. I love it. I still love it. I've been there for 10 years and it was like home. But what, what hit me was, and I think I spoke to this on the Zoom call when I was processing my grief around not being able to film him there. What hit me was that the fear is so predominant in our systems, essentially, that care for elders and care for the dying. I respected that, you know, we had had it figured out. There'd be two visitors at a time. His experience in the hospice, inpatient hospice, would have been very different if we had filmed there because of COVID, limited visitation. Um, so in a way, it all worked out, you know, and it, we got to honor his life in a way that really reflected his um, being. Um, so ultimately, it was a blessing. But at first, it felt really, really tragic. <laughs> So. Now let's now let's back up a little bit. Um, as I rushed into that question because it was just like in the front of my head. I was I was watching this clip, just like this frustration. Um, um, so let's back up, Aditi. How did it come to be that you were caring for Ethan? How did you two connect? So I have a a, a brother named Jojo, not my biologic brother, but a, a spiritual friend brother, um, Jojo Silverman, who lives in Asheville. And as you noticed at the beginning of the film, Ethan had quite a wide net uh, on social media, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook. So Jojo had been following him um, for some time. And he had mentioned Ethan, but I never had time to check out his posts. So when Ethan was admitted to the inpatient hospice in Charlotte, Jojo said, hey, um, this brother's in an inpatient hospice. He's pretty much alone. He doesn't have community in Charlotte where his father was living at the time. And Jojo said, hey, he called me as the hospice doc in Asheville and the community organizer um, and our friend Scott Kirschenbaum, who is the director of this film. He just put out the call, like we have to help this brother, essentially. So that's how I got involved, really as a, a friend who happens to be a doctor who got him where he needed to be. And Hannah, how did you get involved? How did you connect with Aditi? Mm, it's a lovely part of my life and a great story for me, at least. So I heard about Ethan, um, it was March of 2021, and I heard about him because at the time I was working with the Conscious Dying Institute, I still am a little bit training people to be end-of-life doulas, as I have done for the last couple of years. Beautiful organization, for those of you who don't know about it, um, Aditi and I were both trained, and I know some of you on this call are a part of CDI, so thank you for being here. And so anyway, some of my colleagues from the Institute asked me to share a link um, about this young man who was live streaming his vigil for the world to see. And so I'm sitting there in March watching this and I don't know anything about Ethan, but I was really struck by him and by his courage and his vulnerability as Aditi said, and just his willingness to share his dying with the world. I'd never heard of or, or seen anyone do that in that way. And so I was really inspired and curious about him. Um, and so I went to learn more about him and watched a lot of his videos afterward and realized what an incredible soul he is. And at the time, I didn't know who Aditi was or um, or that well, I knew of Aditi through the Institute, but I didn't know that she was in the room with him, I should say, or that anyone was filming anything or that any of my dear friends to be like Jojo and, and Nate and all the others who were there taking care of Ethan. I didn't know anyone was there. But it was this moment where there was this deep knowing that something was happening, that there was a connection um, within me that I couldn't explain at the time. And then fast forward to a few months later, the director, Scott Kirschenbaum, reached out to me through the Institute asking me to share the trailer for this film um, that was being made based on those last couple of weeks of Ethan's life and the beautiful care he received from Aditi and the, the team of doulas. And 
at the time I'd been desperately trying to get involved with other film projects, especially around grief specifically, because I'd always been drawn to film as a medium and as a storytelling tool to wake people up and, and open hearts around death and grief and, you know, allow us to live more fully and change the way we approach not only death, but life itself. And so when Scott reached out to me, um, he asked me to join the project at this point. This was last October. And it was that same deep knowing within that I'm absolutely supposed to say yes. And so I was brought on as the impact producer of the film to use the film as an educational tool to raise awareness and shift our culture's approach to conscious dying and conscious living and being more present with death and using death as a teacher so we can live more fully too. And so it's been over a year now since I've been involved. I moved to Asheville in January for the film and felt just incredibly at home here. And I was inspired by a blossoming friendship with Aditi and the community here. This community has become like an extended family to me as it was to Ethan. This place is just amazing. And it has drawn together this incredible group of people who it seems like everyone's converging here for this particular moment for the same cause, which is to change the way we live and die. And it's, it's a really unique and beautiful group of heart-centered people. So I feel really blessed to be here. And so I stayed because of the community, long story, long story long, and um, to be a part of the Center for Conscious Living and Dying that Aditi founded, largely inspired by her experience of caring for Ethan. I know you dreamt of this for, for a lot longer than that, but I think it was really catalyzed by um, the Ethan experience, as she calls it. And I dreamt of creating or co-creating something like this too for a really long time, a community-centered place to spend your last days that's non-medical and spirit-centered and deeply supportive. And so when I came here and was naturally somehow a part of what was unfolding, it felt really faded um, or kismet. So that's how I came to be here. And, and I realized I didn't tell everyone I'm a little under the weather, so I sound a little more hoarse and raspy than I usually do. Just bear with me. <laughs> um, I do want to get into the details with both of you about the uniqueness of this arrangement, this community-centered care that Ethan received. But maybe we should back up a little bit. I know there are these wonderful end-of-life doulas on this call, but there may be folks here who really have no exposure to what an end-of-life doula is and what they do is. And maybe we could talk a bit about that and maybe the two of you could share your journeys towards this path uh, towards being doulas. I'll let you after you, sister. <laughs> after you, Hannah. <laughs> Since you've been training death doulas, maybe that's a question for you, and I can let you know my path to this moment. Yeah, I think Aditi and I have had similar journeys in that uh, I'm a nurse by trade. I was a hospice, became a hospice nurse almost nine years ago. Um, and I got interested in hospice because I wanted to be a part of healing that took place at the level of the soul rather than, um, you know, Western medicine's approach to largely looking at healing as if we're just these bodies um, was my experience. And so I loved hospice. And then six years ago, I moved to Key West, Florida uh, for my partner's job, my then partner's job. And there was no hospice available. They had just um, closed. And so I was sort of distraught and wondering how I can do the work that I know and love. Um, so in the meantime, I worked at a behavioral health facility and facilitated psychotherapy groups and, um, you know, supported people through bereavement care. And I did my energy medicine thing. And I enjoyed that, but I really missed end of life care. And I was wondering how you can provide end of life care when there's no hospice. And so I found out you could become a doula. And so I went and was trained through the Conscious Dying Institute. And it really affirmed for me what I'd always been looking for, which is this holistic approach to end-of-life care, where it's not just the body that you're tending to, where it's not fully prescriptive or medicalized or institutionalized, where it really is the big picture. You know, how do you want to be supported physically and mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and practically? And how can I support you in, in creating and, and advocating and, um, and enacting that plan, basically? And so that's how I got involved. And I've been training people to be doulas ever since basically Aditi yeah so my path was um 
as a hospice volunteer when I was in college. And then I ended up going to medical school, did family medicine training, extra training in hospice palliative care, and then worked in an inpatient hospice for about 10 years. But early on in my training, I noticed, I, I just really became so clear how we had medicalized death and that we really, really thought of death as a medical event. And you've heard all this, many of you, but, um, you know, death is the ultimate failure and you die when medicine can no longer take care of you or medicine can't cure you. So it's really medicine's fault, you know, and it just it didn't after being at the bedside of so many and seeing um, kind of seeing how it wasn't as terrifying as um, people thought. Um, I realized that there's so much more that could be done to really honor this part of life, and I was finding so many people coming to their deathbed unprepared terrified that lots of unresolved family uh, interpersonal dynamics a lot of fear. And so that's where I felt called to, to be of service and to help um, kind of address that, that which I was noticing. And the end of life doula piece, the non-medicalized holistic end of life care support, really that path allowed me to bring aspects of myself that weren't just the scientific medical part of me, my music, my presence, my love, my, you know, all of it, my spirit to the bedside. And I was doing that anyway, but when I found out there's actually a, a path where I could learn and um, take care of myself in that, because self-care doesn't really exist in medicine. And so it was just a beautiful marriage of spirit and my, you know, mind, heart, spirit, body, all of it. So that's how I ended up doing it. I think I have a question, follow-up question for Hannah, because I'm just very curious about this. You know, as a trainer for other death doulas, I'm curious to what and what I keep hearing again is, you know, that this is all of what's most important is the spiritual care, the holistic care. And I'm curious for trainees, how much work goes on within yourself to cultivate spirituality that might exist already? And because I feel like that should be part of like the job description for any end of life doula is like one should be in touch with one's spirituality, whatever that is. And I'm curious how that uh, gets realized in training. Yeah, it's a, a great question. And I can't speak to, I can only speak to the Conscious Dying Institute because that's the only organization I've trained with. So there's, you know, as this doula role is sort of on the rise in this zeitgeist moment that we're all experiencing. There are so many doula programs popping up everywhere, um, but I can't speak to what those are like because I haven't been through them. And so I don't, I don't know, but for the Conscious Dying Institute, a large part of the curriculum is about that exactly what you're saying. The whole first part of it, really, the whole first half of the program is about hollowing yourself out and examining your own relationship with grief and death and your own beliefs um, implicit bias and things like that so that you can be with someone and not project your own stuff onto them, which is so important. And so much of the organization that Aditi and I are a part of, the Center for Conscious Living and Dying, is about tending to that and creating that culture where we all just realize we're mirrors for one another and what, what we see is really within ourselves in many ways and learning to sit with that and explore that and tend to that um, with intention. And so I could talk about that for a lot longer, but that's what I'll say for now. It's it's essential, an essential part of it. And it's a piece, yeah, that I, I think that's so beautiful, Hannah. It's a piece that is really missing in our um, medical model. So this idea that how we, what we bring to the bedside or the patient encounter, you know, the visit, really doesn't matter it's not it's not there like so so we don't really think about the impact of our own perceptions um traumas etc on the care that we're providing as as medical profession professionals so i think that it's essential and I, i've seen that how that can be very detrimental um staff reacting or or you know not really honoring that their their triggers are being you know are occurring and and how does that affect the experience of the people in the bed dying? It's, it's really a thing to address. So. so let's go back now to what happened in Asheville, this unique scenario of community care. And I want to hear more from you, Aditi, about what made caring for Ethan 
very different from all other folks that you've worked with in the past? Um, Ethan was a really, as you probably gathered from that prologue, he was so um, vulnerable, real, honest, direct, um, speaking to things that um, with so much love and grace and not just poor me, why me, not reactive, just very matter of fact. So there was, he was clearly tapping into some, some truth of our human condition, our humanity. Um, so he, just, I, I really believe we had like a sacred contract if you've heard of those, but just a deep connection. And I've had some powerful connections with people in the past that I've cared for, <clears throat> including my mother-in-law, who was one of my best friends. She died in our home in 2019. And we did a very similar thing, surrounded her with love, community, did a home funeral, green burial. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, with Ethan, I think it was um, sort of the the time frame we we really we had to, uh, we didn't know how much time we had like i said they didn't want to transfer him from charlotte to Asheville because they thought he would die en route so it could have been minutes to hours to days it ended up being two weeks so there was this sense of um if we're going to do what we need to, what we feel called to do which is honor his wish to film his dying days and be in community we had to move fast and so i think the magic of that was we had to get out of our mind like it was very much for me, there was no time to, which I typically am a person of many lists, a planner. I can't say that anymore because it's starting to fade, <laughs> but um, I would have really thought through, can I even discharge him from the hospice and become his doula? Am I allowed to do that? I later checked in with a lawyer. Did I do anything wrong? I didn't. But in the meantime, it was just, and I describe it as a mystical experience. For me, the minute I got that call from Ethan to the minute to now, but to the minute he left his body, it was, I was in an altered state of consciousness. I was in this, what I've later come to understand as a flow state. I was in the state of receptivity, allowing, um, trusting, intuitive space. So I knew exactly what to do, how to do it, when to do it. So that was the difference for me, that it was a life changing, transformative experience. And I think everybody, if you ask people, the community, so, so then I, we put the call out because we really needed to gather community in a short time. And there were lines of people ready to serve. And everybody was tapping into that same, the energetics of what was happening with Ethan. And if, if you've been at the bedside of someone in, the dying, in their dying days, you know that there is a sort of a portal open, same with birth. There's an energetic that you can't really put words to, it's ineffable. And that's what made it so special. It was a collective coming together with a shared vision, shared purpose of honoring this beloved soul. So, Hannah, I'm curious, have you ever experienced this kind of flow state that Aditi is describing, whether in the care for someone who's dying or not? A great question. And I would say absolutely yes. I think that's what draws us to this work is that for speaking for myself, I won't speak for you, Aditi, but I'm pretty sure it's true for you <laughs> as well. That's where I feel most at home because you don't have to be anybody. You just get to be yourself and you just drop into your heart. Um, and so I've I've definitely been in that state, although I can't say that I've had um, a connection like Aditi had with Ethan. That was pretty remarkable. And I think once in a lifetime. And so I won't speak to that, but definitely being in the flow state in that state of surrender at the bedside. Mm -hmm. And I've also never, what, what's unique about this is, um, you know, in Key West, when I was, I was basically the main, there was, there was not a lot of end of life care support. And so it was a unique situation. So I didn't have hospice or palliative care. It was like me being the point person for a lot of um, holding a lot of roles. And so I think what's so beautiful about um, the Ethan experience is that everyone brought their own strength, background, and niche. You know, when you're able to show up in the way that lights you up the most, that you bring, you know, your unique magic as an individual, I think that that was that played a role too, I think. And so that's really beautiful, beautiful aspect of community supported death care is that it takes a village. And when the village shows up and brings everything that they bring, it, the magic can happen. And I think that's what we saw. We, as if I were there. <laughs> I've seen the film about a thousand times, so it felt like I was there. You saw, you felt, you know.
And I think you're right, Hannah, when I think when you're learning, when you're really unlearning what you've been taught about death at the bedside. So for so when the mind will definitely as you're you know sitting with people who are dying and if it's the first time or second time the mind will you will be thinking am i doing this right am i doing this wrong what should i be doing so those natural thoughts came up early on as i started working with the dying and i'm sure you too hannah but then over time you start to surrender you start to really let go of um yeah you so we i think most providers probably feel a, a little bit of that flow state and that surrender you know, this for me, this film and hearing the background to it, it it's it's it is a life cycle, you know, and it's it's Ethan's death, which ultimately birthed the Center for Conscious Living and Dying. So can we hear more more about that, Aditi, and what your hopes and dreams are for the center and its origins? Thank you. So I'm back in 2014, I I had a right, right after I finished my training, it was pretty early on that I thought, huh, I think we could do better as a culture, you know, for, with aging and dying. And I called together just this, invited a bunch of folks, 20 people to gather, artists, musicians, psychologists to gather for a, re a weekend retreat at the Light Center in Black Mountain. I said, what, let's just vision, what could, how could aging and dying look different? And out of that came this beautiful vision of this intergenerational community where we had alternatives to nursing homes and gardening and you know it's a collective vision because I've, I've heard many people have a similar vision it's a matter of let's just get it going but um and that that community kind of connected and grew together but then fizzled out i started having children and life happened but those are the same folks that came together for ethan so it's sort of been this um everybody's been cultivating their own presence of death and the center for conscious living and dying initially was an llc that i was sort of doing on the side as a passion project it was um, really education outreach trying to get people to reflect on mortality and um, those sorts of things but when ethan was taking his last breath i was literally in the room next door and i was so clear that it's time to leave my profession as i know it and step into this next chapter and it was again not a thought it was like a knowing and so that's what i did when he took when he died i took i put in my three months notice and i just said i i surrender like i'm here i'm so i'm at service to whatever this is whatever wants to come forth so that led to ccld being changed to a nonprofit. i became the director um let go of a partnership that we were in before and i started researching like what what did we do for ethan what, what exactly was it that was so exciting and so invigorating for everybody and so life-giving and it was really community supported end-of-life care and so i started researching what's out there and other countries have done this but in the u.s during the aids crisis these residential homes popped up all over the country and there there there's now a network of these homes called the omega home network and you can look it up there's probably 40 in operation 40 in development quite a few in new york and they're basically just residents, residents and run by volunteers who are extended family and caregivers. So hospice comes into the home, which is what happened with Ethan. They provide the medical care and then the community comes together to provide everything else. And so that sort of um, uh, is the direction that CCLD headed with direct, a direct care piece. Now, every state has their own regulations and licensure requirements. In our state, if we don't charge for services and we have three people or less, we don't have to be licensed or regulated. So it gives us a lot of freedom to do acupuncture, to do massage, to bring in uh, sound healers without having to, you know. So um, the, and I just got a question, hospice comes into the home. So hospice, um, multiple communities, I mean, multiple hospices can exist in a community and those are licensed agencies, Medicare, um, there's a Medicare benefit. Are you all familiar with that, Jean? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So we have two major hospices in our region, and almost everybody can access hospice generally free of charge um, through their benefit. And hospice can does offer care in the home, nursing home, or a facility if you have one, an inpatient hospice house. But with Ethan, we contract basically he his insurance covered hospice to come into the home, provide the bed, provide the medications, provide CNA support, chaplain support. Um, so that's what we'll do here. Um, so the Omega Home Network model is what we're 
modeling the direct care piece after. And so family, again, the volunteers become extended family. And it's really, you know, with our caregiver crisis, with the, for some, a burden of caregiving, and with the number of elders that don't have children, you know, that don't want to end up in nursing homes, um, this is a really beautiful, creative way of supporting folks. And then CCLD will have this education branch. Some of the, one of the charitable purposes is education. So that includes going into schools, communities, really engaging in this conversation, and then offering another piece, which is retreat style experiences and workshops and um, possibly doula trainings and apprenticeship. So people can actually be around death and kind of not be so um, hidden from it. So those are the big, that's the big thing, the big vision. Aditi, you know, you're mentioning that community-centered care could is potentially so important for folks who may not have children who are who have been aging solo or you know uh, that kind of thing, and it it just brings my mind to some of the reimagined programming we did with LGBTQ plus communities and how useful I think this model could be for that community. And I'm just curious. Maybe this leads me now to your role, Hannah, as impact producer for the film, I'm curious to learn more about uh, your strategy plans in terms of education and outreach and partnerships um, and what's what, 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 what your dreams are for this film ultimately when it gets released. Wow, that's a big question. And Andy, I'm just gonna put it on the record and say you can be the ambassador <laughs> for that department because <laughs> there are so many their avenues. Um, I mean, ev everybody needs this work. And so we have a lot of heavy lifting to do. And I'm really excited to see what happens. Um, my mind is spinning right now because we just saw Stephen Jenkinson, for those of you who know him, was visiting in town. And we saw him in, recently. And so my mind is still reeling from a lot of the things he said. And one of them was, um, I'm going to butcher his words. So Stephen, in the off chance you ever see this, I apologize. But he was speaking to how cultures who knew how to end things, it wasn't traumatic for them. Death is traumatic for us because we don't have the support to know how to deal with the end and to be with the ending of things. And so in a general sense, I would say that that's the overall mission, um, is that this, first of all, the model of CCLD, that that can be a way shower for other communities to emulate and replicate this model of community care so that every um, city or community can have a home like this. And if there's not a home like this in every community, can at least the communities feel a resource and supported enough to go into people's homes together to, as a team to provide this level of support. And so the idea is really to um, decentralize, demedicalize, and take back into our own hands and reclaim death as a, as a part of life, a natural part of life that can be tended to at home rather than in a facility, can be tended to by loved ones, as you said, Aditi, by this extended family. Um, and I think, as you mentioned, this model is emerging at a time, at the perfect time with the caregiving crisis we're facing, where typical end-of-life care costs are unaffordable, um, where we warehouse our elders, as I think Stephen Jenkinson also says, you know, and, and we sail on through life without really grappling with and facing the, bur the burden that it should be to have a loved one who's declining. You know, the the, the it, it's something that we should not turn away from. And so that's one piece. And then second to that, this lens of the emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, the way we've neglected and denied and feared death for so long, and looking at the implications of that on our mental health and our spiritual health and, and reclaiming death as a part of life that deserves to be tended to with meaning and intention um, and, and actually being a teacher so we can live that way too. So CCLD will hopefully replicate that model and offer education, as you said, and retreats and teach individuals and communities how to provide this care for one another. Um, and the film is a huge part of that. So the film's going to spread and galvanize the mission, hopefully, because it started as a grassrootsy, bootstrappy project, and it's turned into a pretty incredible film. I can't wait to share it with you all. And what we're hearing um, from these work in progress fundraiser screenings that we're doing because the film still needs financial support to complete, just putting in a little plug there. We're hearing people say, I didn't know that kind of care was possible. How can I receive that care? 
or how can I ensure that my loved ones receive that level of care? Um, and separately, how can I provide that level of care myself? You know, how can I become a doula like Aditi? And they can do workshops after screenings that the film will host and Aditi and me will facilitate. Um, and then hopefully they can come to CCLD for additional education and trainings, hopefully. So there are really infinite, um, exciting plans we have in place, some still to be determined um, to use the film to empower end of life care communities around the world. Um, some of them include, you know, at the festivals, the film festivals, we're applying to doing grief ceremonies after those and bringing in live musicians and um, all sorts of fun ideas we're playing with. But we're going to definitely do these little pop up travel workshops after screenings of the film to start and then directing people back to CCLD for additional education. Maybe I should have asked this question immediately after we played the clip, but um, perhaps those of you who are uh, on with us, if you want to share just a few reflections that you might have had after watching that clip, what what images and what words sort of remain with you after seeing that clip? I, I bet Aditi and Hannah would be really curious to have that. And in the meantime, there were some other questions posted in the chat, Hannah and Aditi, and maybe um, the two of you want to pick a few of them. Um, and folks, you know, you're also welcome if you want, if you're comfortable, you can uh, raise your hand and we'd be happy to call on you too. Um, so let mm. us. I'll start with that. Um, Aditi, there's a question that you might want to answer. How does a death doula, um, it says meditate, but I think it maybe means mediate between other community members giving care and also between loved ones. So that looks like a good one. And also someone asked, Sky, you asked, what does the grief ceremony look like? Um, and basically how we would do it is initiate music to get from here into here and to, you know, any ritual is to step out of the ordinary world into um, an intentional time. And so that's basically the purpose is to all gather with the intention of moving through and metabolizing the grief that we're all carrying, not just from the death of our loved ones, but from, you know, the environmental destruction that we see every day, mass violence, you name it, whatever, the litany of things we see every day that we're holding, that we stick our heads in the sand about and pretend we're not holding. And so providing people an opportunity to move through that together in community through music um, and through gathering, basically to do that. You know, the first grief ritual I ever did, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good about dealing with my emotional stuff. And I, you know, I can release and move on and come home and be with my kids and compartmentalize. And, um, but when I did my first grief ceremony, it was such a visceral experience of like, there's music and there's like again getting out of the mind and the head and it's just allowing whatever grief is stored in our body to just release so i wept i wailed and it felt so good you know as a professional you're expected or yes the energetics of it are very kind of contained and so the grief ceremonies can really be healing and powerful to witness and to partake in so and all, all cultures around the world have rituals with drumming and music and shakers to just you know even if you just move right now, it feels good. So <laughs> um, the question about, you know, being a doula and kind of a mediator, if you will, or a bridge, I think we have a lot to learn from the birth movement. Um, birth doulas have become more integrated into the care of birthing mothers. They get to go in the hospital where I work and they get to sort of be a liaison between the mother and the medical provider. And ultimately, that's the vision of what a death doula will be and should be. It's not quite so integrated into the hospice model yet, but I think that will come. So it is definitely a role of, of a doula to support the loved ones and the, and the person dying to communicate with the hospice team. So. Appreciate these comments, they're beautiful. Thank There's you. a question here from Jack and Ned about dealing with your own emotions, your own feelings, your own grief as you're caring for um, someone when they're dying. Um, you know, often 
caregivers don't get the care that they need. And I'm just curious what strategies the two of you have in place for yourselves when you are caring for someone. Yeah, I think for me, the biggest thing, and in this film, I cried, you know, I allowed myself to feel and not be closed off to the sadness that was present. Because even as, as beautiful as death can be, it is very sad. And there's a lot of grief that comes up. So allowing it to move through, release it, that enables me to just go to the next moment and be fully present versus carrying stuff that I'm not resolving or releasing or, or acknowledging. And then for me, you know, life, children, mountains, nature, music, good food, <laughs> good friends, all the good things. I would say the exact same thing and just the importance of ritual on top of that. Any little segment that you can have to anchor yourself in the present moment to really even open yourself up to what you are feeling. Because if you just go on one moment to the next, um, sometimes we're not fully aware of what is coming up in our bodies or in our hearts. So just being intentional with our time to really be aware of what am I feeling and then letting ourselves feel that. Did the two of you see the question from Annie in the chat? How does a death doula mediate between other community members giving care and also between loved ones and the person going through dying? That's a great one for a DP because that was very unique about the Ethan experience. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm, yeah. So, so much of what we do is um, care of the whole person, the whole unit, the whole community. And so many times as a doula, I have really had to put out fires. I've had to, you know, really tend to the family and the, the, the loved ones. And so that's a big part of it. Kind of the, in the hospice model, there's a social worker who tends to that piece. There's a chaplain who tends to the spiritual piece, a nurse, you know, who tends to the physical. And I feel like as a death doula, I got to, and with for Ethan specifically, I got to do a little bit of all of it. And I love that because really that's what I mean by the integration of my whole being. So. And so much of what I, the only thing I would add is so much of being a doula is not fixing, getting away from our tendency to fix and to bandaid things and really to allow people to feel what we're feeling. And especially with family, um, because grief um, so often manifests as anger and, um, frustration. And so just being present with that and compassionate with that and realizing the tenderness that's underneath whatever's coming up and just being able to hold, hold and sit with what it is. Looks like Annie may have a follow-up question here. Annie, do you want to unmute? Hi there. Thank you for this. I have a question on another topic and a cat. Um, so um, who also would like to say hello um, so my in-laws, um, are in another country with a completely different system and I was, and I think often about providing end of life care for them. Um, and I wanted to know if doulas work with loved ones of people going through dying, but not necessarily the people going through dying themselves. I, that might be an ethical issue. I don't think my, my mother and father-in-law would perhaps be open to the idea, but they are not currently at that stage. So that's why that's kind of the background of the question. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. You know, this is a great question because so many times children will come to us and say, and I don't know, I can't speak for you, Hannah, but we'll say, you know, I really want my parents. Can you can you call my parents as a death doula and can you help them? And I'll ask, do they do they want to talk about this? Do they want to um, explore their death? And they'll say, no, you know, no, but I think it'll be good for them. And so a mentor of mine, a good friend, Greg, has often says, you know, I'll give them our number, like we'll give the child the number to give to their loved one, but we'll have to wait for the parents to reach out to us before we can engage. Because, so, but that said, um, I think the support of the of you, for example, Annie, would be so valuable to help you navigate the complexities that may come up and help you kind of know how to approach the conversation or, you know, so I think that, I don't know, Hannah, if that really exists, a, a doula for the caregivers. I know there are some doulas that really 
are passionate about caregiver support. So that could fall under that category, I suppose. I would say it happens all the time because a lot of the time what you said at EP is right. We give our phone numbers and then they don't call, but the children, we're saying children, adult children <laughs> will call us for support anyway. And so that it just sort of happens naturally. I hadn't thought of it in that way, but I've helped a lot of people, a lot of family members who's the actual person who's transitioning don't, they don't end up calling me, but I'm there to provide support for their family. So I think it happens often. I think there's a need for it. Yeah, I get a lot of calls from children just asking basic questions. My, I just got one yesterday about somebody in the ICU, his dad's in the ICU, and he just said, nobody's talking about death. What can I do to get this, my father home? So I navigate, I kind of guided him through that more acutely, but I think preparation would be great. Mm -hmm. If you ever wanted to reach out to a local doula to get some support. Mm -hmm. I think we have, oh, here's a question from Lori. Go ahead and unmute. Okay, I'm in, um, I was originally in Charlotte, North Carolina and, and met um, Ethan's mother, Linda. Um, when she came down and we never met in person because of COVID, but I was her, her, personal uh, end of life uh, death doula uh, through Ethan's illness. So I just wanted to preface it, but I do a lot of community education. I'm really big on important life conversations. And so these are the, you know, the conversations that families need to be having all along um, before there's a crisis such as imminent death or being put on hospice. And so um, Aditi, I'd love for you and Hannah to maybe introduce, and I'm happy to work with you with it because I already have PowerPoints on this, introduce important life conversations into your curriculum so that doulas can be encouraging the communities they work in to have those conversations, the legal conversations about advanced directives, the, the financial conversations, how do you pay for end of life care? When do you give up the car keys? You know, uh, how do you want to be buried? You know, what are the uh, directing your care? Um, I just buried my mother and I um, last month, she was 99 years old. And uh, it was just a beautiful experience because of my, I'm a nurse, I've been a nurse for 50 years, but um, because of my end of uh, life doula training and work. Um, uh, my younger sister is a pediatrician and she was clueless about how to give mom a supportive and beautiful death. And my older sister was paralyzed with fear. So I was it and it was a blessing. And, but we've, we had those conversations with mom way in advance, you know? And so I just want to put in my plug for important life conversations and having them with the millennials because they're the ones that are going to be stepping up and dealing with this caregiving. I kept turning to my sisters and say, which one of us has a kid that's going to be able to do this for us, either physically or emotionally or financially. So um, yeah, reach out to the millennial populations because they need to be having the conversations with their parents before there's a crisis. Thank you. Thank that's you. my for the day. Thank you so much, Lori. And it's so important. And I think that's what makes this film unique is that because of Ethan's age, there is an appeal to, to younger populations that we're seeing, which is awesome. So we're gonna leverage that for sure. And part of my brain fog, cause I'm feeling a little <laughs> not well. Um, I totally spaced and forgot to mention that part of the impact and outreach with the film will be that we'll hand out screening guides so that end of life uh, care educators like yourself can can go through a screening guide and do advanced care planning and have, you know, initiate those conversations about death with people. So thank you for reminding me of that, because that's an important piece. Yeah, and that speaks to kind of what reimagine is, you know, talking about his values and intentions. There's really no way for your loved ones to know what your values and intentions are if you don't talk about it ahead of time. So that's very important. Thank you, Lori. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Anyone on the call want to raise their hand, ask a question? You can also use the chat if you're shy. I see Jean had a couple of questions, so maybe I'll quickly answer those. But um, the vision, you said something about wanting to create a home in your town community. That is the vision, that communities that want to have uh, an end-of-life care home that's run by 
community, the volunteers, I think that that, that should be uh, doable and possible. And then the film should be shown all over, I'm sure. Hannah, the question was, will it be shown in their state or town? So, Aditi, how many beds in your home? Three. There'll be three. There's nothing yeah. stopping us from opening yeah. other rooms, though. So you could have a separate building with three, three more beds. Some mm -hmm. communities have done that. And that keeps the health department out? Mm -hmm. It's just a residence with some some folks hanging out. What's the length of stay for your um, clients at your homes, the patient? Do they come in at the very, very end when they're actively dying or do you take them in during the transition? Yeah, two months or less prognosis is the idea. Okay. I see a question in the chat about getting recommendations for a doula directories. The NEDA, N-E-D-A, National End of Abdul Alliance has state specific information for Abdullahs in your region. Hannah, do you have any other resources? No, um, I mean, through the Conscious Dying Institute, people have been trained. We have a doula directory there as well. Um, but I would go the NEDA route and look at a state and you can always reach out to the doula who's listed and ask if there are other doulas that they'd recommend if they're unavailable, because not everyone's listed all the time. Um, and, and I also welcome you to, Andy, if, if you'll give everybody our contact information, but my I'll, I'll put my email in the chat and I would love for anyone who's interested in doing screenings of the film in your community to send me an email and I'll organize a list so that when we start doing our screenings and our tours, we can um, reach out and get that going, get you all involved. After this call, you know, when we prepare the follow-up email for everyone with the edited link for the video, we can also include contact information and additional resources. I can work with you to craft that. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Does Hannah and do you guys have a budget? Like if I if I did this um, in Madison, Wisconsin, where I'm located, would you be able to fly to a community event, fly out? If you have a budget for that, or have you not talked about that? We, we do have a budget. We, we, so basically we're still trying to fundraise for the film and then separately we'll have a budget for the impact campaign, which is to do educational screenings and things. So we have, we have a budget, but we haven't gotten there quite yet. We welcome donations <laughs> to, to allow us to do that in the future. Okay. We have time for one more question, but if there aren't additional questions, we can also wrap up. Uh, I I just, uh, oh, how do we donate? Why don't you guys put something in the chat? Don't miss this opportunity. That's it. I know I appreciate it. I'll find the link. Um, I'm going to pull it up. I want to thank both of you for um, helping kick this month's theme off, values, intentions, and wishes. It was such a beautiful way to do it. Um, you've touched so many hearts here just on this call, and I think all of us are really excited to see the finished film uh, when that's ready to enter the world. And it was really a privilege just to have this sneak peek um, at what you're doing. So thank you for that. Thank you, Andy, and all you do to reimagine. I can Seriously. I just thank you for having us. One more thing, if anybody's interested in, in learning more about Ethan, his Facebook page is still up and running and it's um, E-T-H-A-N-S-I-S-S-E-R-E as Howard, E3, Ethan's sister, E3. And his Facebook page is still up and you can, um, prior to seeing the whole film, you can access um, his spirit on his Facebook page. Thank you, Lori. I think they changed after Ethan crossed over. Um, they changed his Facebook name to We Three W E Three Connection, I believe. Oh. Or there's it, it might be a separate page that there's there are thousands of people who supported him and who um, loved and adored love and adore Ethan. So you can go there as well. The We Three Connection. But I, I encourage everyone, first and foremost, to follow the film on social media. If you go to the website that Aditi put in there, the last ecstatic days movie.com, you can click on the social media links and it'll send you to the film social media because we post videos of Ethan all the time. And it's a great little way to network and 
commune with people there. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Trina asked if she could come to CCLD. Yes, we're actually Airbnb being the main house. So please reach out to us if you want to visit. I'm going to send you this in my email. Thanks, Trina. Great. Well, thank you both again. I'm wishing everyone um, warmth and meaningful holidays that are coming up and uh, hope to see you all back next Wednesday with us at Reimagine around the same time. Uh, we're going to talk about love and stuff, all the material objects uh, that are meaningful to ourselves and to our loved ones and the importance of having those conversations about the stuff. So um, join us for that. It's another film, actually, which you can watch on PBS. Um, it's called Love and uh, it's called Love and Stuff, and it's by Judith Halfan. So we have a film theme. I didn't realize that until now. So anyway, um, wishing you all the best, and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. So Thank you, Andy, so much. Thank you all for being here.